Hey, and welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. And we are back, obviously. Okay, cool. So I'm sure that many of you kiddies went and saw Jurassic World since our last episode. Um, three of us did. We won't go into spoilerific details until our 50th episode. More about that later. But uh, just real quick, what were you guys' thoughts, you know, without, again, going into the plot? What did you guys think of it? Fun but stupid. Would you say it's better than the other sequels? Uh, yes, I'd say absolutely better than 2 and 3. Um, you know, for me, what made it was Chris Pratt. Uh, who, you know, there was a couple months ago, there was the rumor that they were eyeing him to replace Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After seeing Jurassic World, I'm like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we turned to each other. I mean, we I think we all had spoken about it before, like we feel like he could, you know, because of seeing Star Wars. I mean, the beginning of freaking Guardians of the Galaxy is like a weird kind of space Raiders of the Lost Ark. Except he dances. Yeah. Um, but, uh, what Indiana Jones was missing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he does a little jig as he's running away from the boulder. Um, <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a lot of moments in this movie that felt very Indiana Jones E like that. Uh, I feel were like, here's the proof, you know, you know, uh, and of course with Spielberg as executive producer, you know, he saw all that yeah, shit. Exactly. So again, it's, it's a, it's a very fun movie. I think it's, you know, it's, it's in the vein of. Dinosaurs get out again. I mean, how many times is this going to happen? But uh, uh, you I know. mean, how many times is the James Bond going to save the world from espionage? But that's you know, that's the everyday everyday occurrence. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, where's where's my James Bond stops uh, climate change movie? Yeah, give it to me. <laughs> Come on, MGM. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I understand. Like, you can't have a Jurassic Park movie. Oh yeah, what if it was a Jurassic Park movie where the dinosaurs don't get out, and so they're just like touring the park, and they're like, oh, that was lovely. Yeah, they have just a, they have a nice weekend, or just not make <laughs> any more. Um, whoa, 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 Jake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the way the way that Children this movie love the way that this dinosaurs. Mo- the way that this movie's going. Um, I mean, they're gonna make a squillion because it's making a lot of money. Yeah, I believe I saw that it had the. Uh, ended up getting like one of the highest opening weekends uh, worldwide over uh, 500 million over yeah. 200 of that that's in the insane. United States but you know again I know that you can't make a Jurassic Park movie without them escaping I know that's all just me being stupid asshole Jake but um <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's stupid asshole. Jim. He's the worst. He's the worst. Go away, you. The, the worst of the bosoms. Get away, you freak. Um, but uh, yeah, again, just it, it is a lot of fun. I mean, I couldn't help but you know, that big smile on my face during most of it. So, Josh, uh, this one had the most emotional resonance with me. I laughed. I had to hold back tears towards the end. Got a giant boner. Yes. Um, this was a Jurassic Park movie I was waiting for, you know, because all the others were just high-octane action. This one had everything a good movie needs. Just so we're clear, are you saying this is better than the first Jurassic Park? Yes. Ooh. Oh, I, I just look, said we shouldn't make any more Jurassic Park movies, but you just said it's better than the first one. Wow. And so, look, to be to be fair, it is a common misconception that the first movie is always the best in a series. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not ruling that. I mean, clearly, Doctor No is not yeah. the best. It's James a common movie. common misconception. Nor it's, Casino Royale. Oh, I, I, uh, Skyfall is better. I know. I know. Well, you no, I, I, I'm being facetious with the oh. comedy. The well, that came out. That came out after Doctor No. Did it? Yeah, I, thought it like I thought it was the first. First, sixty-seven. Nope. There was a TV movie that was in, based off of Casino Royale, which is technically the first adaptation. But, uh, but yeah, um, you know, the first Harry Potter movie actually kind of sucks. Um, and, yeah, I yeah. look forward to your letters. Uh, the <laughs> oh, I look forward to all the hate for. Jurassic I mean, to be Park. fair, pretty much every one well, that I know that's a huge Harry Potter fan agrees that the Harry Potter movies are terrible. And they don't get good until like three or four. Well, it's yeah. like it's like how can we piss off our listeners? I'm like, don't make any more Jurassic Park movies. Josh is like, this is better than the first one. And Sam's like, the first Harry Potter movie. Sucks. We're trying to cover every end of yeah. the spectrum. Well, I mean, I agree yeah, with I guess Sam so. on yeah. Harry Potter. The first Star Trek film. Oh. I've never seen the first Star Trek. Wait, wait, like, the, oh, for, like Star Trek the motion picture. That's the one. So boring. So yeah. bad, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the most beautifully shot. It is beautiful. I will look at still frames of it <laughs> forever. But I don't need to watch it ever again. It's the slow motion picture. <laughs> um, oh. I would put Jurassic World between uh, Lost World and Jurassic Park three because Lost World, for a good chunk of it, is, for me, is right up there with their right up there with the first Jurassic Park. Yeah, no, I love Lost World. Yeah, you know, it, it kind of gets silly right around the time where the T Rex raids the camp and all the guys are running and like one of them hides behind like a waterfall and gets eaten. Really. The moment that where they run into the tall grass, where I'm starting to be like, 
what you doing, Lost Par- Lost World? What you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, to be fair, yeah. like the sequels. I mean, obviously we've re- you know uh, watched Commentary's all. Commentary's available now. Commentary's available. <laughs> and um, to be fair, like they try to be something different. You know, they're like, hey, you know, the park fucked up in the first one. Like, you know, it's Hunters vs. Gatherers in yeah, Lost yeah. World. And then the third one's like William you know, H Macy versus dinosaurs in the third one. Yeah, he can swim. That gives him an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, thir- the third one is, hey guys, we forgot pterodactyls. That's the third movie. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And three D printing's a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the fourth one, man, it's 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 fun. It's um, it's a good time. However, me and Jake saw a movie that would you say is better? Better than Jurassic World. We saw San Andreas. San finally, Andreas. That that rock earthquake film it very, was very much in the vein of like twister or i guess armageddon or yeah. uh fun fact twister first hollywood movie printed on dvd yeah <laughs> which is why i own it <laughs> yeah. do you still have it like sealed yeah, still still in the shrink wrap because <laughs> i've never been like oh man i want to watch twister yeah. yeah i remember as a kid i was like hey you know it's entertaining but i was never like ah like i, I was I remember seeing it in the movie theaters and being like, oh, hey, a flying cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody, everybody was like, there's a flying cow in it. I remember that in elementary school. Yeah. But yeah, very much in the vein of, of Twister and The Day After Tomorrow. Though I, movies. Yeah, movies. I would say San Andreas is better than either of those films. Oh, yeah. I think a lo- largely for me because of The Rock, but yeah. You said that you found him to be like the least charismatic rock. Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I don't, I don't think that was like uh, a problem with his performance. Less than Escape from Which Mountain. I never saw that movie. Um, but the original is Christopher was it, Lee. Was the, it better with than Doom? <laughs> y- oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but no, but the thing is, I think that was part of his character. Like his character is not this like charismatic. I save people. Watch me. It's so much fun. Like look at that smile. The rock smile. It's like he's very serious, and I think that's what it needed. The people's to be. rescuer. The people's yeah. rescuer doing it's like you know he gives the earthquake a uh, people's <laughs> yeah. elbow. That's what causes the earthquake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Does it right to the fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back to where you came. Just it doesn't matter where your earthquake's <laughs> from. He, um, he's just fighting with Triple H on San Andreas' fault and does people's yeah. elbow and just that'd be cool. Just, yeah, and cool. then like Superman won for the rest of it. It's basically <laughs> kind of like what would happen if Lex Luthor's plan succeeded. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and Superman wasn't there to fly backwards around. The, yeah, you so, get you uh, get a uh, very intense Paul Giamatti face. Yeah, throughout the entire movie. Is there really any other kind of Paul Giamatti? I mean, you get like super intense Paul yeah. Giamatti. You face. get like orgasm face. Yeah, there's one yeah. scene where like, uh, oh god, there's a there's a uh, there, there's a death in the movie. Um, there's lots. Yeah, but there's a death that affects <laughs> no, no, Paul Giamatti. Just, G- just one, just one. It's just the only death in the movie. They wanted happens. to make it PG. Yeah, and it happens in the beginning of the movie. Like Paul, spoilers, but like it's Paul, not even earthquake related. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He trips and falls on the stairs. He's like, oh god. Um, that motherfucker. Um, his uh, PG guys, PG. Yeah, yeah, his his. They do say fucking it though. They do. Um, not quite like. I mean, my favorite Paul Giamatti is still shoot him up. <laughs> okay. oh, oh, so good. Yeah, I own that too. Yeah. <laughs> Currently, among Voodoo's uh, Father Day sale, right? Well, HDX uh, month of June sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For eight dollars, you can have your own digital oh, he, HD copy. He was good in Paycheck too. Better than Aaron Eckhart. No. Because that's Eckhart's jam is the bad guy. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you were saying, but back to San Andreas. Oh, but like, okay, spoiler, but like one of his, his like research partner dies near the beginning. And there's a shot where like the director clearly must have been like, all right, Paul, so for this scene, we're going to be on you. But what you're going to be seeing is a destruction of a city with an earthquake and your friends just died. Go. And I remember I turned the same afterwards. I was like, I don't think Paul Giamatti's ever seen an earthquake. Because look on his face, <laughs> he was just like, ooh, ooh. And I know like the face, the facial expression you can't see on the podcast, but trust me, it's funny. Um, should have taken a picture of yeah, it. That, that should be that the video. podcast selfie. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, video. Yeah. But no, it's, it's actually, it's a really, really entertaining movie. Uh, just like Jurassic World is kind of like a check your you know check your mind. It, it's, it's kind of the exact same thing. I just honestly I just like San Andreas more. Um, well, it was you know one of the better Grand Theft Auto games. Yeah, <laughs> it does have Alexandra Daddario. It does. She's actually really good in it too. She um and it's cool because once again she's not just the damsel in distress where like people are saving her. There's a, there's a scene where she's in trouble, but it's not because she's a girl or anything stupid like that. It's because if anyone was in this jam, it'd be you'd be in, you know sh- you yeah. Know, Fucked, and um, you can say it. James. So she yeah. gets. Uh, yeah. we're, we're not oh, going wait. for PG. Uh, okay, now we, now we can. I, okay, I'm, I I mark these episodes as explicit. Okay, on iTunes. okay, excellent. Yeah. It's and after so 10 o'clock. there's a red E <laughs> yeah, next to it. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, she gets saved by um, this these brothers that she meets uh, earlier on in the movie. And uh, 
But the cool thing is, because her dad is the rock, <laughs> she knows how to like she knows how to do everything, like how to like you know yeah. what to do in a disaster. So she's the go to person, not the brothers. And so that's really cool. And you know, um, all the charisma like really comes from their interactions, her with the younger brother and the older brother. Um, and it's one of those movies, you know, it's the classic disaster thing where the main characters are always at the beginning or the end of something horrible happening. They don't get there and it's like over. Like, oh, okay, that, good thing we missed that one. It's like, you know, when a tsunami's going to break, The Rock and Silk Spectre 1 from uh, Watchmen are going to be there to go over the freaking, you know, the, the wave. But, like, there's so many moments that are, like, hilarious that aren't supposed to be hilarious. But there's a scene. Because they play it, like, I think they, they play it so seriously that you just have to laugh. I'm sorry. I thought about one thing in Jurassic World we can't say yet. <laughs> Again, tune okay. in the episode. Yeah, next week. I, I, I won't say because yeah, you know, I, I, you know, definitely don't want to spoil anything for Chris. But for San Andreas, there's a scene. It's in the t- it's in the trailer where like, um, what's her face? Carla Gugino. Thank you. Uh, I can never pronounce her last name, and I want to say it wrong. So Carla uh, from Cheers is uh, or <laughs> or the first Sin City. Yeah, uh, I'll just say Silk, Silk Spectre. Um, <laughs> she's like running around, and she's like, oh my god, oh my god, and like in the trailer, the sounds for all some go. yeah for some okay. reason Kylie Minogue's in that movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so she, uh, because Kylie Minogue is amazing. I mean, I love her pop stuff, and she makes a pretty good cameo in Street Fighter. <laughs> yeah. she, Street Fighter is not her fault. Yeah, but she just kind of shows up in San Andreas, and then kind of doesn't show up anymore. Yeah, yeah. And doesn't she was listen. great as the Green Fairy in Moulin Rouge, and that episode Voyage of the Damned in Doctor Who. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, I wanted her to be the new companion so much. Sorry, Jake. Go back <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, She's like running around trying to find an escape route because the rock's like, get to the roof. Get to the fucking roof. <laughs> and she opens a door. Hold because on, real quick. Do you think there's a deleted scene where he's yelling, get to the chopper? I hope so. <laughs> um, but she's with um, her possible future sister-in-law who's like a royal bitch. Kylie Minow. Yeah. And um, she runs through uh, the door trying to escape. And so... Silk Spectre runs in after her to open the door to like see what happened because she c- doesn't really care but kind of does like oh shit well she's under my watch she opens the door and like the entire room is gone so when she opens the door she's just looking out to the city and looking down like hundreds of feet to doom and she looks down and there's a man hanging on a flagpole and when, when she looks down he looks up and he goes oh no and he lets go and he falls and it's like I don't know why it was like the funniest thing in the world um but, you know, there's a lot of times where, like, they try to, like, really pull in your heartstrings where, like, the tsunami's coming. Yeah. And they have, like, that obligatory shot of, like, the old couple. And they look at each other and they hug one last time. And yeah. I remember Sam was like, I guess we're not going to be watching the Graham Norton show, whatever the hell. <laughs> I know. didn't. Uh, oh. Good thing oh, no, we Jeopardy. Good thing Jeopardy. we take yeah, Jeopardy. Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. um, but we yeah. survived the, the great crash. We could survive yeah. this. But at, at, at this point, though, like, there's been so much chaos and destruction. It's like, why now with this scene Yeah, like we've this? been so desensitized. And they have this, like, point. really awkward shot with a like, police officer. Remember, like, they zoom in on her face? Yeah. And it's just like, why now? Like, yeah. you know, we've been hit so many times. And I have to say, the movie is intense. Like, the destruction is really intense. I like, mean, it's the entire, I mean, San Andreas isn't just, like, Los Angeles. It goes at least as far north as San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I mean, Oakland and all that. It's, it's all... It's really intense, but it's cool because like there's plenty of great little silent, quiet moments. You get to see Mister Fantastic from the shitty Fantastic Four movies as an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, the man. new Mister Fan? No, oh. no, man. Whiplash, man. Whiplash. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's it was surprisingly like really enjoyable. Like I, you know, I think Sam and I went going th- to- for five dollars. Yeah, totally thinking. Oh, it's five dollar movie, but I think we left a little bit with a little bit more than we yeah. thought. I slept through. I slept through the. Goldfinger re-release at seven. I was like, "Fuck it, let's <laughs> yeah. do, let's do uh, San Andreas." Yeah. I was too busy like having people fix the crater, and that was my. Friend. Didn't, uh, is that the one when we were like trying to think like what uh, what good trailers are going to see? Probably nothing. They're probably going to be stupid. And we sit down. The first trailer was Star Wars, and we're like, yeah. "Oh yeah!" yeah. <laughs> and then the second one was Mission Impossible Five. We're like, "Oh yeah. yeah!" And then I don't remember what the rest of them were. We didn't get anything good. No, after that, no. it was nothing good. I feel like I got. Uh, did you get Spectre when you saw Aloha? Yeah, I did. That's pretty good. What do you think of that movie? Here's the thing. Um, <laughs> I love Cameron Crowe, and I've said this many times. Um, I defend. I will defend Cameron Crowe um, because I but don't not today. Yeah, <laughs> but even with even with Elizabeth. Talbot. Yeah, and actually, I will say this because I know when I first came home, I was like, Aloha is not 
I, when I came home, I was like, Aloha is not his worst movie. It's Elizabeth Town. I will say this. I've got some time to think about it. No, Aloha is his worst movie. And I'm not just jumping on it going like, like everyone else going like, oh, I heard Aloha sucks. Fuck that movie. Like there's plenty of like prime time, beautiful Cameron Crowe moments in that movie that only Cameron Crowe can do. Like there's a great scene. I don't think you guys are going to see the movie. I don't think you care. Um, so <laughs> so I can spoil it. But there's a, it's one of those scenes where like Bradley Cooper, when you first meet him, is meeting Rachel McAdams, who's his ex girlfriend and uh, trust me i'm not going to try to explain the plot because it's actually really confusing and this is one of the problems with it there's so many things going on um it's a cameron crow movie with nukes yeah it's a cameron crow movie with nukes and space and every sound ever recorded at once being played to destroy a thing in space that actually happens and bill murray gets <laughs> arrested in aloha yeah and bill murray gets arrested um because he's trying to privatize space with a satellite full of um, weapons. You're actually selling me on the movie now. I, I, you know, I'm gonna buy it. I know you probably don't want to go uh, and 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 see it in theater, so you should help help camera crow out, man. Does this movie have like a secret plot they didn't tell anyone? There, yeah, well, you wouldn't see this when you watch the trailer. So anyway, uh, Rachel McAdams is there, and she's like, "How long's it been?" And he's like. 13, 12, 13 years. Meet my daughter. She's 13 years old. So immediately you know that like Bradley Cooper is the husband, you know, the husband, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the father. And the, um, Rachel, Mc- Rachel McAdams, like husband at the, now is John Krasinski, who's like silent for most of the movie. That's like his charm. So there's a great scene where uh, oh, well, the movie's like in its third act and basically uh, Bradley Cooper's like, look, I'm leaving. Do you need to tell me something to Rachel McAdams? She's like, I think you already know. He's like, because I think I already know too. He's like, well, she's like, well, just say it. And he's like, Father's Day rolls around. Do I have something to celebrate? And she's like... And then you see the kid push the piano down the escalator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, yes. And he goes, okay. But there's a great scene because before he asks that question, he sees her. And she, she kind of likes him. Like, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? You know, they have dinner at the house. They have a friendly relationship. And he just sees her as just a girl, you know? And he goes into his hotel room. He's, he has that scene with Mitch McAdams, and he's like, "You know, do I have something to celebrate Father's Day?" And she's like, "Yes." And he goes outside and he sees her for the first time as something completely as a daughter. And it's a great camera crow moment, kind of slow mo. He's kind of looking at her like Bradley Cooper really sells it. But basically, the whole movie goes on crazy all the A B C D E F G plots going on, and you're like, "Wait a second, this movie's about to end," and and there's no moment of realization between the two that they're father and daughter. Um, whether she knows it or not, and you find out she doesn't, and so the movie's about the end. I'm like, holy shit! Like that's kind of a weird place to end the movie. Like they had not had that resolution. Like that's a very Cameron Crowe thing to do. They have that great moment between a father and a daughter, because um, so much, so many of his great moments in movies are about great relationships with family. And so at the end of the movie, she's like, it, it's in Hawaii, so they're doing, you know, like the the um, the hula, the hula. Thank you. And so like she's, it's it's a cla- like a dance class, like it's glass windows everywhere and there's the teacher standing there and they're all looking at the teacher and they're all learning and bradley cooper drives up and he gets out of the car and he's like watching her and she's doing it and he's like kind of like you know amazed by how graceful and beautiful his daughter is and she happens to see him standing out there and they look back and forth at each other while the music's going and they're dancing and without saying a single fucking word of dialogue they have the conversation that bradley cooper basically she looks at him and they have this great moment where they're looking back and forth and basically what he's saying to her is like I'm your father. And she goes, is that true? And really you're my father. And there's a great moment. And so like, while she's doing the hula, she starts to like break down and sob. Like she's like sobbing while she's doing it and like falls out and she runs outside real quick and they like hug. So without saying a single word of dialogue, they have this great father daughter moment, like, you know, just with facial expressions and music cues. And then she runs back inside, composes herself and starts doing her dance again. And that's like a great, and that's how the movie ends. Um, but, and you know, there's other little points throughout it, but, it, it is. It's a movie that's all over all over the place. Um, is that what sucks about it? That it's all over the place. Yeah, um, because I would have just been fine if it had nothing to do with this like secret privatizing space thing. And Bill Murray, I like Bill Murray. He's hilarious. Him and Emma Stone have like a great scene where they're dancing in a bar. But I would have loved for it just to have been Bradley Cooper coming back to Hawaii. Like he has some reason to go that it's not this whole privatizing space thing. Um, and like maybe he has like come to Elizabeth Town. He has family there or something. And he meets Emma Stone. He kind of has a thing. They become a thing. Um, and he learns to like let the past go with, uh, with Rachel McAdams. He helps inadvertently helps secure Rachel McAdams and John Krasinski's relationship, makes it better, um, and then realizes he has a daughter and his place in the world. Like, it would have been... They didn't have to be all, this other thing, all these other things. Um, but I, I told Sam after I saw it, you can expect two things from a Cameron Crowe movie every single time, whether the movie's good or not. Um, great, great classic little dialogue moments with Cameron Crowe that only he can write and a great music 
that he'll he'll play he'll place in in, in a movie. And I feel like part of it is like you know Zeppelin gives him uh, the rights to his like songs because one of the few yeah. because he freaking like. Tour he toured back with in the day, you know, before worked, before they were really accepted in the United States. Yeah, I mean, he wrote for Rolling Stones since he was fifteen. You know, I mean, you guys have seen Almost Famous. Um, I'm assuming everyone's seen Almost Famous. They should. And um, he was a band aid. Yes, and uh, so you you get great music, and I, I I'll like learn about uh, like just bands I never no, normally wouldn't have listened to because of Cameron Crowe. Like the Vanilla Sky soundtrack that he put together is like some of the coolest shit of all time. Like Monkeys, like. S- uh, uh, the porpoise song by the monkeys from the head soundtrack shit that no one would ever know existed because they think oh the monkeys they just know this certain little blip here or there um, and so again the movie you know I don't I, I honestly feel like most movies don't deserve as much shit as this movie's taking I think it's a movie that um, because of the Sony hacks which is unfortunate and because of the, uh, the the controversy with Emma Stone being cast as like a biracial like multiracial character and clearly just being Emma Stone um, it's kind of a bummer. Cameron Crowe wrote a thing about uh, a blog kind of saying, hey, just blame me. Don't blame anybody else. Um, I think the real question on everybody's mind, how does Aloha stack up to Jurassic World and San Andreas? Here's the thing. <laughs> because when I was going into the, you know, I, first of all, we didn't realize we were going to see Jurassic World on Thursday. We were literally just sitting around. I was like, yeah, I was just like, I was like, when are we going to see Jurassic World? You're like, today or tomorrow or the next day. And then I was like, all right, let me check times. Fuck. You want to just go now? And you're like, all right. And I'm glad we went because, again, it was fun. Yeah. Um, but if you would have asked me, like, going to see those three movies, like, put them in order before I saw them, I would have put Aloha first because it's Cameron Crowe. I'm like, dude, I like Cameron Crowe. Two would have been Jurassic World. Three would have been San Andreas. Probably San Andreas, Aloha, and Jurassic World is probably how it goes for me. Um, again, Aloha, um, not my favorite Cameron Crowe movie. Probably his weakest, in my opinion, because um, I finally watched Singles. I had never actually seen that movie before. His, his movie his follow up to or that follow up but a sequel to his the second movie after uh say anything say anything thank you so elizabeth town is safe for now as <laughs> yeah uh good yeah but Wait, I, yeah, I like that movie didn't you just say though that aloha was worse than elizabeth town yeah so elizabeth town is safe it's not oh the, it's, it's not sa- okay i thought it was safe in its in its shit position oh no no, oh, it's safe <laughs> from being the worst. Yeah. Safe oh. from being the worst. It's the worst. <laughs> yeah. um, something we had kind of hinted at the end of last episode. So I went to New York City over the weekend uh, to go to a special edition because New York Comic Con has grown and grown and grown. So they're like, well, let's see if we can do a, a smaller summer one. And they have, and this is the second time they've done it, and it's been really good because you can actually you know, talk to creators without getting mobbed. <laughs> you know, It's not as claustrophobic. Um, uh, in addition to speaking to guys like Greg Pak, who's writing Superman and wrote Planet Hulk, which is available on Netflix, um, <laughs> or James Tinney in the fourth, or, or the guy that created Spider Gwen, um, I got to speak to Brian Bendis, who you know created Powers, uh, currently on the PlayStation Network, and I think they're about to start season two. And I got to, I was talking to to Bendis, and I was like, Hey, man, because I had heard this from around the bend. And as Chris kind of alludes, I like to kind of come up with original questions <laughs> to, to ask people. There's always a little context. Original, to say the least. Yeah, there's always a little context to it. What's your favorite just, Italian just pasta? Sam's the only one that knows the context. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would. I would posit. Well, you were you were distracted by Nicole last <laughs> year. I would. I would posit that half the time Sam knows the context, and the person he's asking doesn't. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> lead off with it i'm always like hey you know i've heard this or i've heard that or because like with james tinian it's like hey you know you're a big horror writer i was talking to my buddy here who happened to be chris and happened to be talking to nicole and i was like happened to have completely (laughs) stepped away (laughs) and i was like he comes in at just as i'm like so what's your this is last year by the way (laughs) is it nightmare on elm street halloween or friday 13th because they all kind of came out around the same time it's like if we're just going with the first film halloween all the way if we're going with franchise nightmare on elm street because that has dream warriors and he's right yeah, he absolutely is, and Dream Warriors commentary is available now. The um, I was talking to Bendis, and we got to talking, and he had during his panel he was talking about how the one thing he wants to write the most that he hasn't written for Marvel would be Indiana Jones. Now that they have that license, and I was like, "Hey, I heard around word around the campfire is that your favorite Indiana Jones movie is Temple of Doom," and he was just like, "Yeah." Yeah, it is. <laughs> and I was just like, why, man? And he's like, well, I, li- I like the darker second entry. And it just kind of came out at the perfect time because when that movie first came out, I, that's when I was deciding, you know, coming to the realization I wanted to become a professional storyteller. 
And I used to, at the time I was working at a bakery, across the street was a movie theater, and every day they'd pay me in cash, and every day after work, I would just go and watch Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Like, so that means every, you know, he studied that movie shot for shot. So that means every single thing that Bendis has written, be it Powers, be it, uh, you know, Ultimate Spider-Man, be it, uh, be it Daredevil, I mean, somewhere, somewhere in that DNA is Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I Also, I, I ran into Ilya, who we interviewed in episode 12 or so, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, got to talk to him about 10 a bit. Invited him back to the show if he ever wants to do it again. Um, haven't heard anything since, so probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was crazy because I got to talk to Bendis more than I got to talk to Ilya, and like Bendis is like the spotlight guest of that particular year. I also ran into Run DMC, which was just weird. But uh, awkward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that so weird when you run in the run into run DMC, man? <laughs> yeah, um, it just happens so often that you're like, oh, uh, this guy again. Well, have you run into any celebrities while you were in New York? Yeah, I, uh, um, I, uh, um, uh, I ran into Reggie Watts. Well, that's cool. Which was a personal uh, thing for me. This was kind of like uh, right as um, what's that? Uh, show that he does with comedy bang bang yeah comedy that was right when comedy bang bang was like getting popular which is where most people found out about reggie watts so he's not doing it anymore uh, awkward yeah kid cooties replacing him yeah but uh but i had known him uh since the uh, uh the break conan days yeah the, yeah the yeah the break between when conan was on nbc and on tbs he did that live tour and reggie watts was like the main musical guest for that tour and that's where I discovered him, and like I just happened to see him, and I was like, "Oh my God, Reggie Watts, you're so you know like can I?" I saw him on the streets, and I was like, "Hey, you know, not to not to be weird or anything, but like you know, it was really cool seeing you. You know, I, I really enjoy your work, blah blah blah." And I was wearing an IT crowd shirt, and he was like, "It's a good shirt, man." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, Reggie Watts knows good TV. <laughs> Certainly knows good comedy. True that, and good music." Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uh, I think, yeah, but I think he's leaving uh, Comedy Bang Bang to do, because he's, uh, is it Seth, Ma- no, he's not Seth Meyers' band leader, he's uh, not Jimmy Fallon, because he's got, no, he's James Corden, for the late, oh, late is he? yeah, he's oh, late, late show, he's a uh, band leader, because he, James Corden wanted a band, and yeah. I guess they were buddies, and he, that's made out in LA, like Comedy Bang mm-hmm. Bang, so yeah, Kid Cudi's the new half of Comedy Bang Bang. He's he's the bang to the bang. I guess to Scott Ackerman's for bang one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I got to talk to Bendis and that was cool because he really was with Ultimate Spider-Man and Daredevil cuz I mean we've all I think had a period if, for those of us that read comics kind of had that period in the late to mid mid to late 90s where we just kind of dropped off because yeah. the comics just kind of started to suck. <laughs> what was mm-hmm. the what was the killer for you in the 90s? Did you just kind of stop reading, you know, what what was it that knocked you out of comics for a while? For uh, for me, either or, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure. You were kind of looking between us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to get like this middle space. <laughs> right. For me, uh, oddly enough, uh, it was uh, Superman's return from being uh, Electric Blue Superman. Uh, like uh, it was him coming back from yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Not becoming it. Yeah. Okay. Well, so hi- him becoming it was actually like what got me into like reading. Yeah. Right. That's why Shocking. I have a poster. There's this <laughs> poster that just stares at me. <laughs> Always. I, I got a new Superman poster and I thought about replacing it and then I was like, nah. Nah, it'd be too nah. weird. I, I would miss it. <laughs> yeah. But no, uh, so yeah, the, the Electric Blue Superman, uh, for better or for worse, is what actually got me into reading comics regularly. Um, but uh, but yeah, his it, the, the, the just like the way that they handled the return to his normal powers and then like some of the storylines, uh, I, don't, I don't remember anything specific because this, um, this is over 10 years ago now, but... Uh, yeah, the 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 storylines were just getting really weirdly convoluted, and I didn't really care about any other characters in the DC universe uh, at the time, and I didn't have really anything, or didn't really want anything to do with like Marvel or or Image, you know, uh, per se. So like, I was just like, Superman's not fun anymore. Granted, he hasn't really been, you know, in hindsight, he hasn't been fun for a long time. So I'm just gonna stop reading, and then like. It really wasn't until I started working at Midtown Comics, you know, back in New York that I got back into comic books. I think for me, what's weird, 
I never was a huge single issue person. I was a much more of a, a trade graphic novel kind of guy, um, kind of gal. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you uh, what got me back in, and I think it was just I just stopped reading. Um, but what got me it definitely got me back in was like the Dark Knight Returns. Um, but then what kind of like kicked it up another gear was Superman for All Seasons because there was like Dark Knight Returns. And it was like still I was kind of like reading. I would go back read old stuff, flip through comics, whatever. And then it was Superman for All Seasons um, that I th- it, that teamed up, I think, with uh, All-Star Superman. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 Superman, Superman. It became like a big time, like, born again Superman fan. Because there was like a long period where I never was like, uh, Superman sucks. I just wasn't interested. And it, it, you know, it took that right. I feel like it's, that, it's like that for most people, like that right story to get you right back in with Superman or anybody. But, you know, The Dark Knight Returns, I feel like, is that for so many people. Long Halloween, Long Halloween was a big one, too. I remember uh, we had, like, a uh, – it wasn't a vacation because it was just, like, an all-day drive-around thing with the parents. We were going somewhere, and I remember I just read the thing cover to cover in the car. It blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Josh, ever get into comics Completely wasted much? the trip. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had fallen out of comics uh, originally just due to, much like you guys have mentioned, nothing good coming out that I wanted to really be interested in. Uh Got back in after a while when, like, kind of discovering Deadpool and, you know, his amazing fourth wall breaking comedy and things like that. Deadpool's a pretty good gateway drug. And then falling out of it by not having a job and not having money. And that'll really do it, too. The erratic schedules of comics being released. Like, I tried to get a box and, you know, have comics collected in there and, like, get a bunch at a time to go and read. So I wouldn't be sitting around bored and all the ones i picked never released at the exact same time so. <laughs> never released on time yeah. or that too yeah, yeah I, I remember i'm still uh, i think i'm still waiting for the last issue of uh nyx uh nyx it's it's it was it, it's it's if i remember correctly it's like x23's like origin story okay oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and like there's like it was supposed to be like a f- uh, like i think a six issue run they only ever made five issues. There was supposed to be a six-issue uh, Kevin Smith um, follow-up to Guardian Devil called Daredevil Bullseye Targets. There was only one issue ever released. It's one of the great. And now, uh, like eight years, not eight years ago, but maybe it was about eight years ago, they released Captain America White Zero. Captain America White, number one, comes out September, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Um, the uh, But what kind of kicked me out of comics was... Um, they just got to a point where it was like comics are done. <laughs> like, like over in the Marvel universe, they had the onslaught thing, where he uh, onslaught is this villain basically created from Professor X's purged emotions, um, of negative emotions, and he kills the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and some other fucking people, and. <laughs> They are reborn by Franklin Richards in a pocket universe. That's where you get, and the reborn cap is the Rob Liefeld cap with like the massive breasts, uh, and <laughs> the the awkwardly like standing profile, but you still see both of his breasts as if you were like almost looking at them straight. So dumb. Yeah, that was my I'm reaction right now on Google. <laughs> Do it. That was my reaction when I was a kid, and I was just like, "Well, I'm done with Marvel." And then over on DC, um. I think uh, Batman was fight, fighting the Ebola virus. <laughs> like, Rachel Ghoul had just unleashed the Ebola virus in the Gotham City. And Green Lantern, like, Hal Jordan's my favorite Green Lantern. He had gone, like, insane. And he was, like, there was that whole zero hour thing, which is just kind of a weird story. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not necessarily against Hal Jordan being a villain, but zero hour, which was the big DC event of, like, 94 or 90, 94, 95, just kind of blew. And so I was like, some pretty cool covers. It does. And I like Dan, Dan Jurgen's artwork as a whole, but, uh, and it counts backwards. It does. Yeah. It's the first issue is I think five. Yeah. Yeah. Five to zero. Right. Right. And the last issue is nothing. (laughs) Just a, which when you actually have the print version, it's kind of like an embossed cover and it's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, this is pretty. But if you just like, kind of like look at it online, it's just a white cover that says zero hour number zero. And you're just like, fuck you. (laughs) But, uh, at that point I was still the same price. Yeah. (laughs) At that point. Well, as a kid, like a lot of the, the, you know, the cover was a big selling point. Mm hmm. Um, even now, I mean, Chris, I'm looking at your like Chrononauts movie variant covers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love you, it. Well, you got all the movie variants, right? Yes. Minus all. like one of the weird ones for like one. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I don't have the kick-ass cover. 
right for for issue one but i do have the back to the future cover for uh, for number one well if there was ever one to get for you true that that was actually <laughs> the thing that got me into the story as a whole <laughs> was was that i saw uh sean murphy you know t- uh, tweeted a picture of uh the, the the back to the future like the sketch version like he hadn't even inked it yet uh and i was like sold i'm at least picking up issue one and then i enjoyed the story yeah it also helped that it was only four issues long yeah um one of the better image books uh definitely one we recommend the uh <laughs> It yeah, was on our top five last week. It was, it was the um, I don't, it, that was just what that's what knocked me out of comics for a while. What brought me back into it was uh, if you got the two disc special edition of Batman Begins on DVD way back in two thousand five, it came with the first issue of the Long Halloween, the Man Who Falls, and I think the first issue of like year one or something and I was like oh this is fucking I don't remember comics being this good because I had stopped reading right before the long Halloween got published and obviously after well after year one and the man who falls and I was like this is really good (laughs) oddly enough uh, Batman Begins was actually what kind of got me back into reading comic books and what got me into reading Batman comic books so I start I have now I have like a long uh, box full of just as many you know Batman comics as I do for my Superman comics because I just kept like finding storylines that I really liked, you know, picking up, you know, like no man's land and, and, um, the war crimes and war, you know, all, yeah. All uh, the, he had some really good events in like the two thousands. Yeah. And after he was done with Ebola, yeah, it got better. Well, yeah, much, yeah, yeah. No man's land with cataclysm and all yeah. that. Yeah. That yeah. Good... Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, fa- uh, I believe, uh, an earlier episode of ours famously has my falling out with Batman, because of uh, Grant Morrison, more so in hindsight, I find out that it's my fault for not actually like picking up all the books and just thinking that I had all of them. At the same time, it is kind of like a departure from what was going on in Batman comics yeah. at the time. Um, but, there's but, a big uh, difference between Under the Red Hood and and <laughs> uh, and the son of Batman and son. Yeah, but like going back and being able to read the stories as a whole, you know, uh, like like seeing the Batman, you know, Zer and R. In the first issue of uh, of Batman Son, you know, or whatever it was, I forget. It might have been Rest in Peace. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no. Uh, rest. Um, or it, it all hinged on R.I.P. But like first was first was Son. Oh, you see, yeah. In the first issue yeah. of Batman and Son, you see the Zeran graffiti. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Like seeing that, like it was there from the get go, and like just like how much thought that like Grant Morrison actually put into the story. I'm just like, ooh. <laughs> and like having every single issue too. Like I when I was going through and like you know cataloging all of my issues, I found out that I was like I only had like 10 issues from Grant Morrison's entire run which spanned multiple years. Yeah. Was, and I was like, "Oh. Oh, that's why I didn't like it." Yeah. <laughs> I I I was complaining that I felt like I didn't have the whole story. It's because I didn't. <laughs> Just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. yeah. And it was scattered too. Like so I would be missing like five issues like here or there yeah yeah and like i don't know how it happened because i could have sworn i was going to the comic book shop on a regular basis at well, the time. i mean if we're talking comic delays there were some delays with the first with batman and son yeah um back when that was first published monthly also at uh, at go i was like i do not like damian wayne at all yeah it is, he doesn't come into his own until like the black glove or something yeah but the uh over on the marvel side what got me back was uh was Brian Bendis's work on Daredevil and and uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. That was just some and Joss Whedon was writing Astonishing X-Men at the time. So like all three, well I don't know if I'd call Daredevil like a fucking power player at least at that time. <laughs> you know, we're still getting the bitter herbs of of the Ben Affleck film were still in the air. But the uh like Ultimate Spider-Man and Astonishing Joss Whedon's Astonishing X Men were fucking money, and they still are. You know, they're some of the best runs on those characters, and so I got him to to sign. Well, not obviously get, got him to sign Joss Whedon's. <laughs> signing. I should have. Yeah, you should. <laughs> You're close enough. You're. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, if I were a celebrity, I'd sign anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, just bring in the most random shit. Yeah, bring in, please like, do. Bring in Californication season four. <laughs> 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 you're not to Coveney. Uh, you're close enough. And just get him to sign that. Um, <laughs> I will sign, you know, DVDs of the movie Freaks. So you know, or <laughs> or or Freaked with Alex Winters. <laughs> uh, really, anything with Alex Winters. <laughs> yeah. All three movies. Yeah. Four. Uh, yeah. What was the fourth? 
Uh, freaked. Oh, freaked. Because uh, yeah. there's because there's both Bill and Ted's Lost Boys and Freaked. Right, right. As far as I know, no other movies. Yeah, though there's always talk about Bill and Ted three. He's always like, it's closer than it's ever been. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> it means that someone else said, yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just offhandedly, like a producer, like in a, in a, in a power lunch. It's like, yes, that, that sounds. Yeah. yeah, sure. Huh? Yeah. yeah. What? Tell yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Talk to my uh, talk to my uh, assistant. Checks in the mail. Yeah. What? But, uh, you know, speaking of celebrities and, and that sort of thing, we just lost one of the all-time motherfucking greats with Christopher Lee. Mm. Um, you were saying bef- right before we recorded, he is your Dracula? Yes. Or at least the, uh, you yeah. know. He, uh, his, his Dracula portrayal, uh, I think, was probably one of the, one of the best ones. Uh, specifically, like you know, his character. Like I, I know you. Uh, I saw a, a tweet that you had done, Sam, where you were like, you know, sorry, Bella, but you know, Chris, Christopher Lee always scared me. Yeah, I was never, even as a kid, I was never scared of Bella Lugosi's Dracula. Yeah, no, same with me. Um, granted, not to to Bella Lugosi's credit, his movie came out twenty five years before the horror of Dracula, which mm. is Christopher Lee's. First and also, film. Hammer Productions just were more intent on being scarier yeah you know much more gothically tinged yeah, and everything exactly. and and like like you said with the timing they could get away with more yeah um and i i think the uh yeah, well, for, also for starters bill lagos only plays dracula twice and the second yeah. time is in a fucking abbott and costello movie yeah. which is a good abbott and costello movie mm-hmm. but the uh Chris, yeah christopher lee's dracula always scared me never got scared of bill lagosi yeah yeah no same with me and and uh, and also, like, I have a huge love of Peter Cushing as well. And the two of them were in Hammer movies constantly, you know, playing playing opposites, you know. Um, Frankenstein. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. But, yes. Yeah. They I mean, were, Frankenstein. They were, Hound of the Baskervilles, where uh, Christopher Lee was Henry Baskerville. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and this uh, this great movie where, uh, where they're on a train. It's uh, I think it's a mummy esque movie but there he was the christopher lee i think christopher lee is the only person to be dracula frankenstein's monster in the mummy on the big screen albeit in separate films but yeah yeah. but yeah uh, but uh but there's some like you know a beast that they found in like the snow in the arctic or something like that and they're trying to transport on the train and like it gets loose and it's just such a good movie i would and uh Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to look it up now that I'm thinking of it. See if I can figure out what it is. Do what do you boys think of Christopher Lee? Mm. <clears throat> well, I um, I'd always I'm always going to know him best from the Man with the Golden Gun. Um, you know, I didn't grow up watching any of the the Dracula oh, wow. movies. Um, he was also Sauron. Yeah. Well, yeah. From the Saru- whom do you serve, <laughs> Saruman? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you know, he's he's in so many things. I mean, of course, you know, like Lord of the Rings and Star and, Wars and, and Star Wars. I mean, know from that as well. But uh, the Tim Burton Willy Wonka. Yeah, but no, I mean, seriously, Dark shadows. Yeah, <laughs> um, but seriously, yeah, Man with the Golden Gun. I mean, oh, he was in Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, he's it's it's not. Uh, it, it's, I feel like his Sleepy Hollow. Sorry to blow up your spot. I mean, again. all I got was Man with the Golden Gun. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, I feel like he, Sleepy Hollow is one of the Last times you see him without a mustache. Oh, really? Yeah, he's one of the village yeah. elders, and he's like clean shaven. Oh, that that movie's, movie's <laughs> the emperor nuts. gets killed by a, a fucking like cross. Yeah, and, and oddly enough, uh, Sleepy Hollow has Ray Park, who played Darth Maul in Episode One, oh. and he was Count Dooku in Episode Two and Three. It's all connected. Yeah, yeah. We're all in this together. High School Musical. When you've been, Ooh. yeah. Ooh. I mean, when you've been doing movies since the fifties. <laughs> <laughs> You're bound to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nobody's mentioned Police Academy Seven yet. Well, wait, I was giving <laughs> that to either you or Josh. He was a voice actor in The Last Unicorn. No, really. Music by America. In Let's recent years, the only things he would come to mind for are his roles in Lord of the Rings and the Star Wars prequels. Like nothing else to memory jumps out for me for uh, his he was, roles. He was in uh, the 1979. Captain America 2, Death Too Soon. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I forgot. I think I'm, he's in the I'm first sure, one, I'm sure, too. I'm sure Marvel would prefer you to forget yeah. Captain America. Yeah, probably him. Well, what was that, his quote? You oh, can, you, um, everyone does terrible movies, but you don't have to be terrible in them. Something along those lines. And I was like, fuck yes, that's awesome. Good, good, good on you, Chris. Good, good on, on you, Christopher Lee. Of course, The Wicker Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The, the good one. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, here's the thing, though. <laughs> Are you trying to say that? <laughs> because that that uh, not yeah, the bees, yeah, yeah, not the bees, <laughs> ah, they're in my eyes. Bees, ah, ah. Um, sorry. he was in that one. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see what you did there, Josh. <laughs> There's only room for great one greatness. One thing of greatness in that, and that's Nicolas Cage. <laughs> or uh, I was, uh, it was one of my buddy's Kathy birth- Bates is in that movie. It was one of my she buddies kicked into a wall. <laughs> yeah. It was one of my buddy's birthdays, and we always talk about the Nicolas Cage. He always brings up the Nicolas Cage marathon I did. So I was looking for a picture of Nicolas Cage to, to post on his wall on Facebook. <laughs> and when I typed in Nicolas Cage, the fucking internet opens, you know, like the arc <laughs> to like all this beautiful. Oh, welcome. <laughs> yes, welcome to Nicolas Cage. But someone had photoshopped a picture of his face on a pickle and called him Pickleless Cage. <laughs> Oh, uh, so wonderful. Um, but yeah, Nicolas Cage is fantastic. Um, no, but here's the thing. Because, uh, you know, Christopher Lee had this fantastic, wonderful, rich life. Uh, and, you, know, it, you know, just life in general. And then also um, on the on the big and small screen. But like I was saying, for me, it's I, I, I'll always know him best as Mr. Scaramanga from, you know, The Goldfinger. Or from, uh, Jesus, you know, The Golden Gun. <laughs> and his cousin was Ian Fleming. Yes, yes. Um, creator of James Bond. Now, again... And he knew J.R.R. Tolkien. He uh, fought with him in World War II? He had... Uh, dr- no, he fought with Ian Fleming. They were both oh, was in the British Secret well, Service. But he did have drinks with, with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, but yeah he, he knew J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, yeah. We talked about the male of the Golden Gun before, but... You know, it's not the best of the Bond movies. Some say it's the worst. I mean, we all probably say it's the worst of the, the Roger Moore stuff. But there's plenty of moments that are, that are fantastic in it. And... Uh, uh, I like the duel in the end. It's kind of anticlimactic, it's but not, I still yeah, enjoyed the duel in the end. The problems that lie within Man with a Golden Gun are not Christopher Lee's fault. Or Roger Moore's. Yeah. You know, he imbues a sense of personality that we don't always see in a Bond villain. Yeah. Um, and he just looks the part. He looks like a great Bond He's just villain. so cool. Yeah, and like, he yeah. is. You know, whether you like the movie or not, his name is, is, is synonymous with, like, the great Bond villains. You yeah. Know? He can't, he reprised the role. when. Remember when they did uh, Goldeneye Rogue Agent? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I own that. Yeah, <laughs> you know why? Because I think that's uh, in that game you get to uh, use the Lotus submarine. That was the big draw. Yeah, and you guess won't... what? I never got to use it because the game froze. I never <laughs> oh, got to that part. So yeah. fuck that game. But uh, he's in it. <laughs> he yeah. comes back to voice Scaramanga in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, thirty years later, like Sean Connery did with from, from Russia with Love. Yeah, which I have on the original Xbox. I have where that he's, as well. he that's cl- a good game, though. It is. He clearly sounds like. 40 years yeah, yeah, older. Yeah, he's <laughs> old. And they have to, because of rights, they can't use Spectre. Yeah, that's right. They rename it Octopus. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stop Octopus. Yeah. And then at the very end of the movie, you fight Red Grant. in an oct- He's in a robot octopus. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember that part in the movie. <laughs> um, that's, that's my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> yeah. No, the Rogue Agent game was actually, like, entertaining up until it skipped. But, um, yeah, he's in that one. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of run out. Yeah. I'm empty on on the Christopher Lee stuff. My he best friend in high school's <laughs> name is Chris Lee. Yeah, yeah so. I remember well, Chris Lee. Yeah. So for the possible eventual movie or made for TV adaptation of his fantastic life, his biopic. Yes, who would you see playing the role? Cumberbatch. He's got the height and the and the gravitas. Mm. As much as it pains me to that. say, yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, either that or Hugh Dancy. What about Hugh Grant? <laughs> I'm totally sorry. I'm totally blink sorry. all the time. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. oh, totally sorry. Some strawberries. Oh, oh, totally sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Are we going to be Dracula again? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh I'm going to kill Nazis. <laughs> Just lots of Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, if, yeah, you, I... if you stab a man in the back, he's not going to scream out in pain. <laughs> yeah. He's going to go, ah, oh, because you're releasing all the air from his lungs. I gotta wonder how That's much a of that life... That's an actual quote that he told Peter Jackson. Yeah, yeah, Peter Jackson just show. kind of backed away, yeah. like, oh, <laughs> I've done it to men. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I kind of wonder how much of that life they would actually be still, allowed to... Still classified. So, okay, well, there we go. Yeah. None of it. <laughs> we only know. We only know scant... Details of what not he personally did, but what his unit did, i.e., bomb Nazi airfields in North Africa <laughs> and uh, and prepare for the Allied invasions of Sicily and Malta. So like, basically, all the fun. Basic. It's basically he lived Guns of Navarone. Well, how where, much do you and think? Where Eagles Dare. How much do you think Ian Fleming, being related, based James Bond off of him? Ooh. Off of Christopher Lee. Yeah. Whatever. It was Lee. 
Christopher. Well, you know what I mean? Like, which is crazy because then, like, years later, he'd play a villain in the movie that he might have inadvertently inspired. Well, and he also always said that his one of his dreams was to be in a Bond movie. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, he's in this. <laughs> he had the golden gun. He did say a Bond movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah not a good one. Yeah, he didn't <laughs> specify. He's like, could you please put me in the spy who loved me? <laughs> and they're just like, no, we're gonna put you in the man. I love the spy. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're gonna put you in the uh, man with the golden gun, where your assistant is the guy from Fantasy Island. So have fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mr. Scaramanga. <laughs> Doesn't he get put in like a locked in like a, a chest and thrown overboard in the end of the movie? No, he's uh, put in the uh, crow's nest. Crow's nest. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Because uh, initially... Where did the hell did I get that from? Well, initially, Britt Eklund, who also appeared with Christopher Lee in The Wicker Man, was like after Roger Moore puts Knickknack in the suitcase when he interrupts them having sex. That's it. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, carries up to the deck of the ship. And you don't see what he does, and he comes back down, and she's like, oh, James, you didn't. And he's like, I damn well did, and they fuck. But in the meantime, <laughs> then it cuts out to, to him and like in the crow's nest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my Harrison Ford impression. Have you so yeah. you haven't se- have you seen none of the Dracula films? No. Zero no, marathon. I mean, Zero. well, I watched the ABGN. Uh, you have a review. Halloween marathon coming up. <laughs> I had seen Leslie Nielsen play him. <laughs> Dracula's dead and loving it. <laughs> yes. That's more based off of Gary Oldman's <laughs> not, Dracula. Yeah, not even. Yeah, you didn't even see like the the Keanu Reeves Dracula with Gary Oldman. Oh, I see. It's no, but fun. that is the one that does scare my mother. That Dracula. Be- the... Because she's afraid of butt heads? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. If I had to guess, that might be it. <laughs> Gary Holt's yeah, hairpiece looks like First time you see him. Of bu- <laughs> butt cheeks. Yeah. Yeah. On top of his head, pale as the day is long. Yeah. yeah. And I have seen... That is a new phrase, I believe. I mean, I have I'm pretty seen... sure I'm the first person to ever I mean, say I've that. I've seen snippets I of probably... other vampire mm-hmm. movies, but you know, vampires were never creatures that really scared me to to kind of jump on this tangent interview with I the will vampire say, uh that uh that uh the the um gary oldman. Ga- yeah the gary oldman one uh visually beautiful because yes. uh who who was that was that um directing coppola yeah coppola really wanted to like strip it down and like do all practical yeah so like every single effect you see in there is some sort of camera trickery you know there's no uh, there's no there's no computer generated effects. There's no stop motion animation. No, none of that stuff. It's all just like there's there's superimposing. You know, uh, double exposure and stuff like that. Uh, Dracula's shadow is a mime yeah. off screen. It's so cool. The but, shot where wow. they they reach for uh, Keanu yeah, from, the the, from the stagecoach. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. The arm grows. And like, yeah. yeah, it's really cool. A feast for the there eyes. There are puppets, as Roger Moore would put it. Yes. What about the rest of me? Um. I forget what Roger Moore says after. Oh that. my tongue! Yeah, <laughs> even though that's not Roger Moore. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, I mean, you know, if I have to recommend, watch Horror of Dracula, watch mm-hmm. Dracula, Prince of Darkness, Curse of Dracula. Uh, it was Curse of Frankenstein. Oh, it was ah, c- yeah. Um, it was Hammer movies. Yeah, Curse or Horror or something. But yeah, The Mummy. Yeah, but he's in Curse of he's Frankenstein's yeah. monster in Curse of Frankenstein, and that's a phenomenal Frankenstein movie. Mm-hmm. The mu- and his Mummy film is great, but yeah, Horror of Dracula, Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Uh, Dracula is risen from the grave, and Dracula, uh, a- <laughs> A.D. 1972, all... <laughs> Dr. Terror's House of Horrors is a pretty good one. When my parents first started dating, uh, my mom... My mom had already seen that movie because she was kind of a horror movie junkie in uh, in college. Uh, but my dad wanted to see it, so, and it was like on TV or something like that. And she's like, I'm going to go away because that movie scares me, and I'm going to, you know, whatever. And my dad was just sitting there on the couch watching it, and... Uh, like about halfway through it's it's a portmanteau so a couple different stories going on one of the stories is this hand that like you know like thing from the adams family that like comes to life and or idle hands yeah or idle hands (laughs) well it's a disembodied hand so by the end yes uh but uh so it you know it, it 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 it's this hand that's just killing people uh my mom sneaks up behind my dad uh, and just kind of like runs her hand across like his shoulder or something like that, scares the shit out of him. <laughs> so I highly recommend checking out that movie too, <laughs> because it has a great personal memory to me <laughs> that I don't remember. Yeah. But you would I wasn't born yet. You would say Scaramanga above all. Yeah, and, and Count uh, Dooku too. From uh, apparently he did Star all of Wolf. his uh, all of his sword fighting from the from the bottom up when he. Uh, 
draws his lightsaber in episode two. It's like the most like grand like yeah. ma. I like, love you know. his hilt. His yeah. hilt. His hilt. His hilt. Very. His cool. hilt is my favorite from the prequels for sure, and it's yeah. one of my favorites from the entire saga. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. One. I mean, say what you will about the Star Wars prequels, and I feel like we have <laughs> his casting at length. <laughs> yeah, his casting was not one of the poor decisions. No, no. he's in, I, and I loved his death at the beginning of episode three. I'm a little upset that he died, but <laughs> yeah, his and, his death was metal as fuck. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, one of the redeeming factors of also, the prequels. Also, listen to Manowar because he did a lot of like the spoken word voiceover for them, or his Charlemagne albums. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah, he's got two. He recorded them in his fucking nineties because yeah. he's metal as fuck. Yeah, so I think. The big takeaway, and I think, I think I found a, uh, I think I found a episode a title. title. Yeah, metal as fuck. Yeah. Christopher Lee, ninety-three years old, metal as fuck. That's a long title. Well, I, 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 I won't. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just say just metal, metal as fuck. Metal as fuck. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Christopher Lee, for being, you know, for all the good memories and just kicking Nazi ass in World War Two. Yeah. And then apparently he hunted Nazis after the war too. So he's like boys from Brazil status. I can't wait yeah. for his, uh, you know, for his uh, like governmentally sanctioned biography. Yeah, they yeah. just release yeah. yeah the the un the declassified uh, biography. Yeah, he's he always said that, you know, I was never put off by the content in the Hammer horror films. Though he by the end of it he resented him still doing it for like decades because he's like I the stuff I saw in World War Two. You know, he's like I liberated concentration camps and stuff. Oof. I'm just like, shit. That'll desensitize you to anything. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, he's a hero on the screen and off, even when he's playing a villain on the screen. <laughs> you know? All Especially was, when he's playing a hero. Well, it was, it was always all eyes on him, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of the albums that I bought from Chris's mom back when she was selling her vinyls was Band on the Run. Mm-hmm. He's on the cover to Band on the Run. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, he's just, like, badass, and everyone's kind of cowering under him, except for James Coburn, because Coburn's pretty cool, too. <laughs> We could go on to cope, but, but but is he as metal as fuck? No, all yeah. he does is like he's in like Flint. <laughs> <laughs> Band on the run. He's also a, part of the Magnificent Seven, but uh, mm. but yeah. So thank you for the memories, Christopher Lee. Now before we sign off for the week, do you guys have any any anecdotes, stories, fun shit? I recently started watching pro wrestling. Oh, how'd you get into that? Uh, oddly enough, so uh, at at um, uh, Awesome Con. Uh, well, that, sorry, real quick, that reminds yeah. me before I forget. Rest in uh, rest in peace, Dusty Rhodes. Yes, so we're talking yes. about wrestling. Oh yeah. Also, also One passed away on grades. the same day as Christopher Lee. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, at uh, at Awesome Con, uh, Seth Rollins was there, uh, as well as one of the divas, but I forget who it was. Uh, but like, I I ended up talking about wrestling and like my. Uh, my, my at the time, you know, view of uh, of wrestling, and then someone was like, "Oh, you should check out Max Landis's video, Wrestling Isn't Wrestling," and it's pretty much it's it's in the exact same vein as m- the much uh, awarded uh, Max Landis's uh, Death and Return of Superman, and I ended up watching it, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is great!" Like I knew that like wrestling had like intricate storylines, and it was like kind of like soap opera f- for men, kind of kind of thing. But I was like, this is ridiculous. If this is actually what's going on, I want to be part of it. So I started. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I've been watching wrestling for like a week, uh, but like I've already like gone back and watched like, you know, older episodes and like kind of figured out certain like where certain uh, characters are in their storylines and stuff like that. And like I have like wrestlers that I like wrestlers that I don't like, like New Day sucks. Uh, John Cena's crap. You know, things like John that. Cena rules. John Cena is the greatest. You can't see me. <laughs> you can't see him. Yeah. Seth Rollins is terrible. <laughs> Hate him. If, when he put uh, John Stewart in a headlock during when he showed up on The Daily Show. <laughs> yeah, well, he can go fuck himself. <laughs> uh, I'm all about Dean Ambrose. What, what? Hey, and they have a big fight tonight. (laughs) There you go. Yeah, on pay-per-view. So, Uh, Josh, you got anything for us? Uh, Well, at the time this episode will have come out, I will have taken the first of two parts of my A-plus exam. So, fingers crossed, everyone who's listening, that I did pass that part. Yeah. And then the second half the following week. Right. Very cool. Best wishes. Best wishes, Joshua. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. The... 
So next week is our 50th anniversary. Or not 50th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this Ooh, a long flies. time. Flies. Yeah. Before technology, podcasts. <laughs> thank God technology <laughs> caught up to us. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys could listen to us. We were right there year. with Wolfman <laughs> Jack. Like yeah. just doing fucking. We're just like good. We're yeah. just that good. <laughs> yeah. Help by Casey the Beatles. Yeah. got nothing on us. Yeah. <laughs> American Bandstand, American yeah. Band this. <laughs> the, uh, um, so, yeah, our 50th episode's next week. And to kind of celebrate, we're going to make it a, a, you know, a double-sized, like, super-sized episode. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions for us, go ahead and hit us up on social media. And, uh, you know, if we if we get to your question, we're, uh, you know, we've got a ass load of, of movie posters, thanks to Mr. Butler. We've got some comic books. And for every question that, you know, we like you can get something yeah. limit to you know however we deem and it's going to be random so you can't be like hey i want that expendables 2 poster you could probably get it yeah <laughs> but <laughs> like no guarantees <laughs> um on facebook we're geek out show and on twitter we're geek out podcast yeah there you have it so and of course each of us have us our own. tweet at us and yeah tweet. each of us have our own individual things just be sure to to hit us up sometime before uh, next let's go ahead and put the cut off at Sunday, June uh, 21st, Father's Day, at uh, yeah. 6 p.m. And, uh, yeah, so hit us with something by then. Yeah. In the meantime, it's been another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric Bonner. <laughs>